So let me just go ahead and uh, I'm going to I'm going to start with the sort of the kickoff and introduction. Welcome everybody to uh, the Torch of Progress. This is our speaker series for the uh, uh, high school uh, online program, Progress Studies for Young Scholars. Progress Studies for Young Scholars is uh, an uh, online, well, it's been a summer program and we're now continuing it, going to be continuing it into the fall. So it's an online learning program in the history of technology. Um, aimed at the high school level and up, uh, we are, we've gotten a lot of interest from adults, by the way, and we will, um, we're, we're planning on announcing a, uh, an adult version of the class uh, relatively soon. So if you are uh, well beyond high school at this point or, you know, into university or, or even beyond um, and you're interested, go ahead and sign up anyway and we will have an announcement soon about what we're going to do for adults. Um, before we uh, dive into today's event, let me just tell you about a couple of upcoming things. Uh, so next week on, uh, yes, that's right. Next week on Wednesday, uh, July 29th, we are going to have a special talk from Danica Ramey, who is the uh, president of the Asteroid Institute and who, uh, whose mission is to defend the earth from asteroid impacts and who will be giving us a, uh, a talk about, about asteroids and, you know, just kind of like, um, what to do about them, maybe. Um, we're then going to take a couple of weeks off for the summer, but we will be back in August. Um, on August 19th, we are going to have uh, Laura Mazur, who is a surgeon and a professor of surgery, and will be talking to us about um, the history and the, and the current status of surgery and also of surgical education. Um, and so I think that will be really interesting to hear from a, uh, from a practitioner in, in the field. Um, I am Jason Crawford, your host. Uh, I am the author of The Roots of Progress, which you can find at rootsofprogress.org. It is a website about the history of technology and the philosophy of progress. I'm also the creator of the course, Progress Studies for Young Scholars. And uh, with us today is our guest, uh, Dr. Anton Howes, who is, uh, the, uh, was recently the uh, official historian of the Royal Society of Arts and just published a really interesting book, Arts and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Changed a Nation. And um, also writes a really interesting blog. So you can find his website at, is it, uh, is it AntonHouse.com? Yep. Great. And he's, um, and he's got a, a newsletter called Age of Innovation, um, which, is, uh, which is really worth reading. So recommend checking that out. So uh, welcome, Anton. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, all right. Um, uh, we're going to do, uh, I'm going to try a little experiment today, going to run this interview a little bit differently than I have in the past. In the past, I've, I've had long lists of questions and um, I felt a little bit of pressure to get through a lot of them. Today, I'm going to try go, uh, going deeper on fewer topics. So um, I've only got a, a couple of topics here and I think we're just, we're just going to explore these um, uh, together. Um, I want to start off with something, uh, Anton, you, I know you did a project uh, a little while ago where you created a, a a large-ish database of inventors um, in a particular area and time period, and you were trying to collect you know, pretty systematic information on them and, and see what patterns emerged about their life and work. Um, can you just start off, tell us a, a, a little bit about that project? Right, so that is my old project, and also in some ways, that's the kind of once and future project. It's the project I'm currently working on. Um, right. So this was a database, originally my PhD thesis, when it was about just under 700 inventors. Then I thought that's not enough. So I had to add it to, so now up to just under 1500 inventors active between the 1540s and the 1850s in Great Britain. Not necessarily British, they could be immigrants, um, but people who are active as inventors, as innovators in Britain. And really the point of that and looking at these people and trying to work out as much as possible that I could find out about those individuals was to try and work out what it is that caused an acceleration in the number of those people and thus an acceleration in the innovation that takes place over that period and then leads to what we now like to call the Industrial Revolution. So where is it that we get this acceleration of growth, um, not just in the kind of um, areas that we're very used to, like cotton, steam, coal, iron, which is obviously very important, but also in a whole range of things that are also seeing this acceleration of invention in watchmaking, agriculture, landscape gardening, textile design, and all sorts of other things as well. And really what motivated that was I'd seen a few cases where people were using similar kinds of databases, but in a very limited way. It'll be, it would often be, you know, here's a number of patentees and here's some stuff they were doing. Or you'd have a very small sample 
Um, Robert Allen had a kind of quite a famous one of just under just under 80 inventors over a kind of similar period in, in, his, in his quite famous book, um, The Industrial Revolution in Global Perspective. Um, and I just thought, you know, let's, let's go, let's have more. Um, because I think to really get a hold on these kind of big macro level changes, you know, the causes of the Industrial Revolution, um, it's really good to actually drill right down to what's happening at the very micro level, at the individual level. So although, you know, I don't really subscribe to this view that there's kind of heroic genius inventors who push things forward, I do subscribe to the view, to the view that ultimately it is down to individual choices, that individuals are matters, even if these individuals are acting in a kind of group. Mm. So really that's what motivated that project. Yeah, that's a, such an awesome project. Um, how many are you up to uh, now, roughly? So the current total is 1,452, but I've noticed that one of the databases I used has now updated. And so I may be adding quite a few more um, <laughs> just so that it's actually up to date and complete. Um, right. you know, Where do you find the these is, folks from? Like what are the sources used to assemble something like this? So the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography is one. Um, I took all of the existing lists that people had used, their samples. So I've created what's essentially the super sample. So Joel McKeer, who you had, I think a few weeks ago, um, he had some work with Ralph Meisensahl with just over, I think, 750 something. So I took all of them. Then there was a bunch from uh, McLeod and Nuvolari, which is another sample based on the Oxford Dictionary National Biography. Took all of them. I took obviously the 79 or so from Alan's book um, and then added more based on often the things that have updated since they'd done those um, databases, but also to try and get a broader view. So, for example, despite adding all of those samples together, there was literally one woman in all of them. And I thought this can't be right. There's clearly innovation taking place, you know, uh, by female inventors throughout this, you know, 1540s to 1850s period. Yeah. Um, so I went out of my way to find female inventors. Mm -hmm. um, not that successfully, managed to bump the numbers up to, I think about 15, 14 or 15. Um, but I guess 1% of the total is better than one person. Um, but also various different industries. So for example, wool, which is often neglected, photography, which for some reason is bizarrely neglected and not really thought about as being one of these industrial revolution era inventions. Um, civil engineering is another one, uh, agriculture to a certain extent and so on. So es essentially taking works about some of those fields and how they progressed and just basically opening the index, finding all of the names, working out is this person innovator or not? and then going through it. So this is how you end up with this mega sample. Yeah, and it must be hard to get biographical details on some of these folks, right? I mean, if they, once you get down, the, you've got over a thousand, you know, and you're going back centuries, this must, uh, there must be some people where you don't have much more than a name and a... Uh, yeah, so that's often the starting place. And, you know, my aim was to try and find out basically everything about them that I could and try to turn that into usable data. You know, if I can find their religion, that goes, gets coded under religion. You know, if I can find their political beliefs, that gets coded under political beliefs. If I can find their skills, who, who did their apprenticeship? Um, what kind of school did they go to? Did they go to school? Did they go to university? What did they study there? And so on and so forth. Um, where were they born? Where did they die? Where, did they, where was their first invention? How many patents? How many prizes? I mean, literally everything. And for some of them, it's actually just very enjoyable detective work that I started with, as you say, a surname sometimes, not even a full name, and maybe a date or a patent, maybe not even a patent, just an invention that someone's heard of. And then I take it from there and go through all of the sources that I know of, um, go through newspaper records, I mean, literally anything I could find. Google Books really becomes your friend in cases like that. But even beyond yeah. that, there's a whole bunch of other databases that, frankly, the sort of thing that I did to, for that research just wouldn't have been possible in the time that I did it. I mean, it would have taken a whole lifetime, I think, to collect all of that information and detail um, for you know, hundreds of people. So I think there's about two to 300 where it was just a name and a date. And now I have a pretty full biography of them. Wow, that's really impressive. Okay, so what are some of the patterns that have emerged. Right, so that's the interesting thing. So I kind of went into this thinking, not really knowing what I was most convinced by as for, you know, cause of the Industrial Revolution. Um, I would say broadly speaking, someone who, who kind of subscribed to what Deidre McCloskey or Joel McKeer kind of think, um, that there's probably going to be something ideas-based, something that, that can 
affect so many different industries at once has, I think, to have a kind of common cause. Um, I wasn't as convinced by the kind of more either coal-based or resource-based or, or incentive-based accounts. Um, but I've noticed a few things in the course of collecting all this stuff. Um, one of them was that the majority of them, and this is a kind of lower bound estimate, at least 55% of them were polymaths. So these are people who aren't just inventing in a single field, but they're inventing in multiple fields. Um, so, you know, someone who maybe starts off as a, uh, an instrument maker of some sort, you know, microscopes, telescopes, and so on, moves into steam engines, decides to then move into chlorine bleaching processes or into civil engineering. I'm, I'm actually describing James Watt there, which is kind of some of the stuff that he ends up doing, wow. some of the stuff that he, he starts innovating in. Um, the same with someone like Edmund Cartwright, that we, he's very famous for the power loom, but in actual fact, he's also quite famous at the time for being an agricultural improver, doing all sorts of experiments with potatoes um, as the superintendent for the Duke of Bedford's model farm, a kind of innovation center, farming kind of R&D center, as well as doing all sorts of other stuff with, for example, a, a quite a delightful one, which is a, a carriage where it was a bit like, you know, those on, on railways where you kind of have two people kind of pushing the thing and kind of self-propelling. Um, think of that, but on roads. So he kind of had this kind of self-propelling horse, wow. horse-like carriage. Um, so that's, that's one of the key patterns that the majority of them seem to be polymaths. Um, the true number is the figure is probably greater than the 55%. The other striking thing was that sheer variety of backgrounds. Basically anyone could be an inventor. You know, you've got Anglicans and you've got religious dissenters. You've got poor people, you've got rich people, you know, some, some of the richest people in the country and also people who are effectively tenant farmers or, or laborers. Um, you've got people who are Whigs, that it's the kind of old, the predecessor to the Liberal Party and Tories, the predecessor to the Conservative Party. You've got people who are radical utilitarians and some people who think that these people um, are kind of leading us towards some kind of disastrous revolution. So in religion, in politics, in background, in education, in the kinds of skills that they had, in where they were in the country, you know, you've got foreigners, you've got natives, you've got women, you've got men, you know, it seems as though invention is something that anyone can do, right? So, so that's the kind ask, of takeaway. Yeah, let me, let me drill in on that because you mentioned sort of both rich and poor. One of the interesting, you know, one of the interesting patterns that you see is um, certainly it seems that in science, like a lot of science seemed to be done by kind of gentleman scientists, like uh, independently wealthy folks, often aristocrats. Mm. Um, and I always thought that was okay. So they just have, they're independently wealthy. They've got time to, and, and for, uh, they have money for materials and time to, to tinker. So they have sort of leisure. Um, but how did, uh, I mean, how did poor people uh, have the time to tinker and invent uh, or be able to afford materials or a workshop or anything? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So when, when you find cases like that, very often they struggle for a bit and then they tend to find some kind of patron. Um, and I think because in some ways the ecosystem for invention or for science, scientific uh, research was fairly small in some ways, if you demonstrated an aptitude, an aptitude or an interest in some of these activities, then finding people who are also interested in this kind of weird, kind of small niche thing, right? Um, means that you can get attention that way. Um, so some people end up being self-taught. They're often doing it after work, you know, into the evening, into the night, um, in those sorts of cases. Otherwise you do, as you say, get people like, you know, Robert Boyle, one of the richest people in the country who is able just to afford to do these things, but also interestingly able to afford to patronize other people to be able to do those things, right? The classic yep. example, I guess, is that he, he is the patron to Robert Hooke, Hooke. who comes from yep. a relatively modest background, but ends up making a career out of, out of, out of science. Um, yeah, and in in the in the class when we talk about the um, the electrical industry and we go back to some of the you know origins of that, Faraday was a, a key figure, and he was like son of a blacksmith who again sort of yeah got a I think jo got a job as an assistant um, by showing uh, showing off some of his notes that he had written on uh, I think on on 
the scientific texts. Yeah, and interestingly, one where I'm, I'm fairly certain, if I remember rightly, that initially when he approaches Humphrey Davy, who was his predecessor at the That's institution, right, yeah. Davy is actually very dismissive of him. It's just like, oh, you're just like an amateur. You know, come back when you've done something more useful, and ends up, you know, being one of the greatest scientists that 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 um, Britain kind of lays claim to, right? Um, and Davy's successor. So I guess there's a bit of persistence that can come with it as well. That certain people, if they're from from poorer backgrounds, it's the persistence can often count um, a lot more than it would for the much richer ones where, you know, they, they just have more leisure to kind of do yeah. these But things. finding, it sounds like finding a patron or finding a, um, I mean, either just somebody who will just support your work or somebody who will give you a job as an assistant in the lab sounds, sounds fairly important. Sounds like yeah. I mean, sources of funding are an interesting case there. It's actually one of those things where where in the data I was able to collect a bunch of it, but not very much and not enough to actually say concretely what was going on. I mean, typically when people, when inventors are raising funding, it seems to be very localized. It's kind of personal savings. You know, if they're a blacksmith, it's that they accumulate a bit through the profits from their trade. Um, very often you've got cases where it's basically a dowry. So they're marrying, they're marrying rich. Um, you know, Bolton and Watt benefit quite a lot from Matthew Bolton marrying the right person. Um, mm. I'm pretty sure, if I remember rightly, that that he initially was meant to marry the elder sister, but the elder sister died, and so he marries the younger sister, and I guess the kind of dowry that came with that was, you know, suggests that he was after something. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, it's often from neighbours, it's often, you know, what's interesting is actually you've got a lot of money floating around in Britain, and increasingly so throughout this, this period, but actually very little of it ends, ends up finding its way to invention. Um, you know, the difference between an, uh, a rich merchant just splashing it all out on landscape gardens versus giving it to, to or, you know, hiring inventors to do stuff. You know, you've got a lot of cases where money isn't necessarily invested um, it's either consumed in a kind of more lavish way or is invested in just completely different things that it's not an, an invention as such just in kind of scaling up existing processes. Yeah, interesting. What are some of the other patterns that you saw or, or things that jumped out? Right, so polymaths, the variety of backgrounds. Um, another interesting one is that they're not always skilled in the things that they actually tend to improve. So for example, I mean, my favorite example of this is a guy called William George Armstrong, who later in life becomes extremely famous as essentially a, a metallurgical pioneer, someone doing, you know, amazing things with engineering, with iron, um, torpedoes, you know, guns. There's the Armstrong gun, one of the huge things in the late 19th century. Um, and yet, if you look at his background, his father was rich, but a lawyer. His mentor was also a lawyer. Um, he himself, you know, he's educated, goes to school. He goes, he's got, has some higher education, but it's in the law. He himself is a law partner for most of his career until I think in his, in about his late twenties or early thirties, he decides, you know, this is a waste of time. And actually my true interest and passion is engineering. Um, so you've got these cases where a lot of the time that even their initial improvements or initial inventions are nothing to do with the thing that they're actually brought up in. Or in mm. some ways, they're often kind of tangential to the way we wouldn't actually expect them to have had the skill in those things. Um, I mean, Edmund Cartwright, who I mentioned earlier, is actually a clergyman. You know, this is just the local vicar has decided to go and invent um, an, a self-acting loom, you know, one that I can power with uh, horses or with water. I think the first one was actually an ox. So, you know. I heard, uh, you know, I heard something about this, that there was, um, I think it was Bill Bryson in one of his books uh, was saying that the clergy uh, were sort of this class of people who, um, I mean, it's a little bit like being independently wealthy, except it was, um, it's not that, it's more like, um, it's more like the, being in the clergy was almost a sinecure. It was just, it was like a really easy job. Your sermons were already all written out. Maybe you even got written sermons from somebody else. Like there wasn't a lot to do and yet you got a salary. And so they actually had a lot of time to study and uh, write up on science and philosophy and tinker with inventions and so forth. Yeah, if they wanted to. I mean, that's the other thing. There's, there's, there's for every clergyman like Edmund Cartwright, there's also probably a thousand who would decide to just, you know, have a bit of fine dining, tend the garden. Yeah, a sure. Bit and, <laughs> and, you know, is there things. anybody... Is there anybody who didn't have, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, is there anybody who just came from like a really 
poor rural backgrounds, like a farmer, I mean, had to be an agricultural laborer working 14 hours a day in the field and like, and had no money and no connections and still managed to invent something? Um, I can't think to... of a, off the top of my head, a rural one like that. Um, although a potential one might be someone like Francis Pettit Smith, who is one of the co-inventors or simultaneous inventors of the screw propeller. Um, he just seems to be a farmer, and I, I, I've actually been, been able to find very little about his early life. Later on, when he becomes famous as an inventor, he ends up doing all sorts of other things. Sure. Um, but the early life is just, he just seems to be a farmer. Um, although he may have been a yeoman farmer, as in a kind of property owning or you know, relatively wealthy farmer. Um, in terms of really poor backgrounds, though, someone like George Stevenson, you know, just working in a mine, um, to then become first someone who tends the, the, the mining engine, you know, is actually quite a bit of a step up. And then from then to go on from there and to, to, to do, you know, become a, essentially a captain of industry, you know, creating some of the first um, passenger railways is, is, quite, is quite a big step up. Yeah, well, yeah, well. Now, a couple of these patterns you've mentioned, um, this thing you just said about they didn't have, they weren't necessarily skilled in the field. And then also the fact that many of them did things across multiple fields. That feels to me like um, the kind of thing that you got several centuries ago when there was just less knowledge overall and it was, and there was more low hanging fruit and it was easier to learn across multiple. Like today, it feels like there's a lot more specialization. Is there any trend you can see? You were tracking it over three centuries, right? Mm -hmm. So like, is there any trend you can see where that sort of, um, you know, po the, the, what you call the polymath and also needing less training. Does that diminish over time? Is there more specializ specialization over time? So it seems as though it does, um, or at least it doesn't seem like there's much going on in terms of trend. It's very difficult to see a trend because it's actually, because it accelerates, the number accelerates over time. That obviously the kind of error either way in terms of the sample relative to the population of inventors um, means that there's a bit more uncertainty early on, but it doesn't seem like there's much of a trend until the late 18th century, and certainly the early 19th century, when it does seem as though invention becomes a lot more specialized, that they're focusing on just particular industries and then doing lots of improvements to those industries, um, and skill apparently seeming to matter more. I think certainly you kind of start off in a situation where certainly in the 17th century, you've got a lot of polymaths, a lot of very well-educated people as well, but educate in a kind of very broad sense um, rather than kind of skilled apprentices or so on. Um, that by the early 18th century, um, you've, I suppose you've got a kind of savant class as, as, as people like, I guess, Mokir or uh, Margaret Jacob um, would say, people who are kind of these very rounded figures or polymathic kind of dipping their, their, their toes into lots of different industries. Um, and then over the course of the 19th century, I think because it becomes a bit more democratized that you actually have more and more people from, from less privileged backgrounds that in some ways it becomes more specialized. Um, although that could also, as you say, just be because the, the number of technologies that can be worked on or improved and tweaked also increases or also becomes yeah. more complex. Um, it's difficult to say exactly why um, that's happening. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, the key takeaway from this idea that a significant proportion of them, and so it's about a third, if not more, again, this is sort of kind of lower bound, at least a third of them essentially seem to have invented in areas where they weren't, they didn't have any formal um, background. And a lot of people yeah. say, well, well, okay, what big deal, you know, what's, what's the, what's the kind of takeaway from that? Well, or how was, how are they getting around this? Are these just sheer amateurs? I mean, a lot of the time it's people who maybe have a vision for an invention of a certain way, and they don't really know how to implement it because they're not skilled in the metalwork or the woodwork. But then they just hire someone to, to do their design who doesn't need to have been an inventor themselves necessarily. Um, so Edmund Cartwright is a case of this where he, he leaves his plans for the power loom to some Manchester mechanics. And, you know, a few months later is complaining to friends in his correspondence that these people aren't working on it because they think it's impossible. Um, so <laughs> he's, he's leaving these problems for, to others in some ways to, to deal with. Or you've got cases like William George Armstrong, where essentially they're just self-taught. They just, they pick it up in their spare time around their careers. And, but it's not formal training. It's not, it's not as though there's a kind of direct impact of skilled people end up doing the inventions because they're skilled. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. When we talk about um, how people learn stuff and training and, and quote unquote formal training, let's go into that a little bit. Um, I, I've been I've been reading more about this. One thing that has been interesting to me is to learn that the university system is not where people went to go learn, you know, mechanical engineering or anything until, you know, maybe even the, the you know, the 1800s, maybe even the late 1800s. Um, right, the whole what we think of as the the research university, that whole model was really invented in Germany in the 1800s, and seems like it wasn't really copied into into in Britain until you know later, maybe even 20th century. So, what do we even mean when we say, oh, so and so didn't have formal education? If you didn't, if if university wasn't even where you were learning how to be a mechanic, what what did formal education even consist of? Um, so typically, I mean, the vast majority of them will have done apprenticeships. Um, so learning by doing, um, kind of just or the sort of tacit education you often get that you go and actually live with the master typically. Um, and as a result of living and working alongside them, you pick up the skills that they have. So go and live with a blacksmith or go and live with a cotton spinner and, or a, a wool weaver and, and just pick up the trade from just doing it, um, alongside them. the sort of thing that I guess nowadays you'd have to pick up by, watching YouTube videos, but then you'd have had to go and kind of be formally apprenticed. And in, in a way, you know, you're, the, the, you're, you're actually bound legally to these people um, for a, a certain term, typically. I see. Okay. So even an apprenticeship is something you're classifying under yeah. formal education. I mean, I was actually, because I was, I mean, when I said it's a lower bound of, 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 of at least a third, the reason it's a lower bound is because I actually even classed whether their father's backgrounds were in mm. those industries and you know if, if the father's back you know just to really show just how many of them um seem to have uh gone into these other fields so father's backgrounds because you know they could have picked it up in childhood um apprenticeships um employment uh what they learned at university so there are a few examples counter examples to the kind of modern research university for example uh Edinburgh, certainly in the early 18th century, starts to teach a lot more chemistry and medicine and um, sciences of those kinds, where it becomes a real hub, I think, of, of particular innovative scientists, you know, not just people who are studying these things, but actually making improvements to things um, in those fields. And so a lot, of, a lot of the great chemists seem to have some kind of influence for either directly or indirectly from Edinburgh. And that spreads to some of the other Scottish universities as well. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to go a little more on this uh, topic of how did people learn, um, this is an interesting thing I, I pick up from Joel McKeer's work is, uh, you know, he talks about the importance of the, the dissemination of knowledge, of markets for knowledge. Um, in your book, Arts and Minds, you talk a little bit about the mechanics institutions um, can you say a little bit about those, what, you know, sort of what were they and what was their significance in, in all this? So these are, I would say, one of the, the kind of 19th, early 19th century wave of how inventors are promoting innovation more broadly and trying to popularize invention as a practice. Um, so the mechanics institutions emerge because a guy called George Birkbeck, who was a, a university lecturer in Scotland, um, Glasgow, Glasgow, if I recall, um, he starts giving free lectures to workers in the evenings. So after they come home from work, he, or, you know, by night time, he starts giving these lectures. Um, and over time, they, even after he leaves, they pull together their resources to, you know, you know, a little bit from each person to pay for other lecturers, to pay for educational materials, to pay for libraries, to pay for scientific equipment for them to have a go on, um, and that sort of thing. And they set up these sort of essentially kind of bottom-up institutions called mechanics institutions or mechanics institutes. The, the, the name can vary from time to time. And then this becomes a bit of a movement that you start to see these things popping up with the encouragement of people like Birkbeck, who becomes a sort of notional founder of the movement, and a bunch of others um, across the country. So the London Mechanics Institution actually still exists today, but as Birkbeck University, but kind of in a, in a, in a neat bit of kind of historical continuity still has evening classes as its main um, selling point relative to other universities. So you get all of these mechanics institutions popping up all over the country and, and they become, I think, some of the main engines for promoting um, not just self-education by mechanics, but also a kind of general ethos, um, what I, I like to call it improving mentality 
um, amongst people who are taking part of these in these institutions. There were also, I gather, um, from reading some of Mokir's work, there were there was sort of a growing market for printed material. You could buy books and pamphlets and so forth. And so I guess some of the, some mechanics and other folks, inventors were self-taught this way. Yeah, there are a few cases where it could be that they were certainly inspired to invent for the first time that way. Um, one might be John Harrison, famous for the marine chronometer, so solving the longitude problem. Um, the earliest case I could find of him being inspired to do something is I think it's an uncle or maybe it's just a visiting clergyman gives him a copy of Euclid's Elements. Um, so essentially a mathematical text, a ge geometry textbook, um, which I guess could be the sort of thing that inspires him to have a go with these things and he becomes quite expert um, in geometry and, and fence, you know, in a way because, because this kind of amateur skill in other things, which he later applies to clock making, watch making. Um, typically, though, I think that the printed word becomes important in a variety of ways. So in the 16th century, I think it becomes important because it provides a new way for um, innovators, scientists, mathematicians um, who are pushing their fields to find one another um, because they're publishing. Um, and so, you know, you might, you might not be aware of some another city, but through that book being sold, you might suddenly know who they are and where to find them even. Mm -hmm. um, also creating a bit of a dialogue, a conversation that people start to, to, to contribute towards, um, but also creating careers for people, you know, that you can, you can become, you can start to turn the writing of these works into something that can then support further research as well. And something the same way that today you've got, you know, popular intellectuals who support themselves through what they write. Um, so I think the printing, printed work helps with that as well. Um, but also it starts to change other institutions. So, for example, if you look at the um, late 18th century, printing changes the patent system, not through any formal reforms, but because suddenly you've got a, a bunch of inventors, people like William Nicholson, um, Alexander Tillich, who I can't, don't expect anyone to have heard of them, but they're actually quite significant, I think, because what they do is they start publishing the specifications, the details of inventions that have been patented from the 1790s onwards. So whereas before you'd have had to go to Chancery Lane uh, or to the Court of Chancery and to actually physically visit and pay one of the patent agents to, or someone to show you the, the, the specifications, you know, and visiting London could be quite expensive if you're outside of London. Suddenly, you can just read about it in a, in a newspaper, read about it in a journal. Um, and, you know, that also happens alongside the Mechanics Institution. You have the Mechanics Magazine ends up being one of the key places where a lot of these inventions get published in um, as well with those details. So they'd select the ones that they think are probably that can be the most important. And even today, these are extremely useful sources that we can use to kind of derive all this extra information from them. So suddenly the, the role of the patent system becomes much more pro-innovation that you can read what the invention is, implement it, you can find those inventors, you can pay them license fees, but also you can improve further on those inventions. Yeah. With all this, I mean, the, both the, in, the instruction, like in the mechanics institutions, also this printed material and so forth, all this is commercial, it's all for pay. So, you know, what was it that, um, what was it that motivated people to spend their money on this stuff? Like today, if you go get a degree, often it's because you're hoping you can get a better job right um but like what was what was driving this you know was it all pure curiosity or did uh, w w why did people pay for this stuff yeah it's a good question um i think a lot of it does rely on just interest and curiosity much the same way that so many things people seem to pay for today just because they're interested um i mean actually that becomes one of the problems with mechanics institutions by the 1850s they're said to be in decline because you, ex, you know, they're, they're geared towards self-improvers in a way and that they enable self-improvers to do things, but actually there aren't that many people who potentially are going to use these, avail themselves of these institutions to, to, to self-educate. Um, in some ways, the mechanics institutions kind of get, start to gear a bit more towards what you might today call infotainment. Um, so less information, a bit more entertainment. Um, there's, there are complaints that they become increasingly middle class. There's actually a political subtext here to the mechanics institutions that 
you know, although Birkbeck becomes a notional founder, a lot of the actual founders of, of some of these institutions, they don't want middle and upper classes involved because, you know, at a time when you didn't have universal suffrage or even universal male suffrage, you know, a lot of these people want to prove that they can create institutions that they can show that they're deserving of the vote. That, you know, yeah. that the working classes are hardworking, they can save, they, they are responsible people who are deserving of, of being given suffrage. And so mechanics institutions, that, you know, there, there are complaints even at the founding of the London one that, you know, oh, piss off Birkbeck, we don't want your money, we want to, we want to demonstrate that we can pay for these things ourselves. Huh. Um, wow. Wow. So you've got complaints that they're becoming middle class. And so one of the solutions, and this is, this is one of the things that the Society of Arts, which is what my book is about, the, the first one, um, does is to think about, you know, what can we do to incentivize mechanics institutions to do what they're supposed to do? And they come up with the, the idea of qualifications that they, you know, we should have examinations that are qualifications that we could use anywhere to demonstrate to employers that we have certain things. So I guess kind of it, it, it commodifies or commercializes um, the attainment of, of that education in that way, which a lot of people found very useful, right? Because what would happen before then is, you know, if you were a, a worker who was aspiring to become a clerk in, in a middle class sort of profession, what you would do is you would probably go to Oxford or Cambridge or one of the universities or University of London in the 1820s, 30s. You would take the entrance examination, you would get in, and then you would use your acceptance offer as your qualification. So you would then go to an employer and say, look, I've done I, I, could, I could get into Oxford. I have got into Oxford. I'm not going to go because I can't afford it, but here's my qualification. So the, the exam system is, is set up by a bunch of utilitarian reformers who say, you know, let's, let's actually do this properly and systematically and kind of in a purposeful way rather than just kind of allowing people to do it that way. Wow. Um, everybody uh, in the audience, go ahead and you can, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, uh, things you want to ask, go ahead and ask them in the chat. Or if you're a student enrolled in the class, go ahead and ask them in the Slack um, thread that I set up um, in the announcements channel. Um, we'll keep going for another um, uh, I don't know, five, 10 minutes and then, and then maybe switch to questions from the audience. So um, Anton, I want to go back to something you touched on a little bit. You were talking about how people got inspired uh, to, mm. to become inventors. And uh, something you told me a while ago about this, this project was you had noticed a pattern in contact between the inventors on your list. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I was saving the best till last. This was the, really <laughs> the big one. Um, and then I got sidetracked. Uh, so you've got polymaths, you've got a variety of backgrounds. They're not always skilled. And shockingly, at I found this, for, and, you know, bear in mind how little information I have about these inventors very often. As I said, for hundreds and hundreds of them, I'm starting with basically a name and a, a date. And yet for 83% of them, of this 1,452 people, they had, before their first known invention, they seem to have had significant, often, prior contact with other inventors. And not necessarily other inventors in the same, same field, um, just other people doing innovation or, or who are very well-known popularizers of innovation. So maybe not inventors themselves, but people who are constantly writing about how great improvement and invention is and kind of, you know, uh, uh, cheerleaders, if you like, for invention. Um, so, and that's really interesting, right? So what I think all of those facts, those trends together suggest is that you've got, and I can trace this, the spread from person to person in a kind of network effect, almost like a virus, I suppose, of what I, what I call an improving mentality, right? This idea that you can improve things, that you, when you look at the world, you see room for improvement, um, you see things that can be tweaked. You see things, I guess today you might call it optimizing, right? Which for some of the inventors can be completely debilitating where they optimize and optimize and optimize to the extent they never actually finish their inventions. Um, and you've got other people for whom it becomes extremely profitable. So, but the thing they seem to have in common is this optimizing, this, this improving mentality or mindset. Um, and so it seems to spread from person to person, right? This is something that I've, I've, I need to visualize it at some point, but create this huge kind of network over time of this person seems to have inspired this person who seems to have inspired this person. And then they start their first invention. And fortunately, when we do have written accounts, they very often confirm that this seems to have been the crucial thing, you know, and there's a, so to give you a few um, examples, some of which you may even have, or some listeners may have already heard of, you know, 
Um, Charles Babbage, famous for his work on, on computing, right, early computing, um, you know, as a child, and he recounts this vividly in his autobiography, in his memoirs, um, he visits the, the mechanical shop, kind of mechanical automaton shop, if you like, of a guy called um, uh, Joseph Merlin. You know, think of the kind of magic that comes with, with that name. I think it's Joseph Josiah or something like um, John Joseph. It's a because he's a he's a Belgian immigrant, but um, but but Merlin is the surname. And he describes how you know he's there with his mother. Um, Merlin notices that ba the young Babbage is taking an interest in these mechanical curiosities and in, in, invites him up to the workshop to have a look at the stuff that he's still making. And what's really great about that is you think, okay, apocryphal story. You know, there's, this is just senile old Babbage is 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 remembering this thing falsely or is kind of you know whatever. Actually, I found. Um, a newspaper record of the contents of Merlin's um, effects when they were sold on. And the two statues that Babbage reports having seen in great detail in the workshop were amongst those effects, like to the exact, like almost described in the exact way. So it seems as though some of these points of flashes of inspiration, and it's not just a single one sometimes, but you know, contact with these other inventors can be extremely influential there. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, one other thing, uh, other topic I want to get your thoughts on, um, you mentioned that this study goes back to what, I think you said like the 1500s, um, and you've commented to me that you think you need to go back that far in British or English history to start to see why they kind of pulled ahead in terms of event inventiveness. Mm -hmm. So, um, just, just talk a little bit about that. How far back do you have to go and, and why do you, why do you say that? So when I did my PhD thesis, I started in 1651, and I was just working back from the Great Exhibition of 1851. It's a big, huge event, which the Society of Arts was also involved in, in doing. There's also this pro-spreading innovation. It's like the first event. World's Fair, basically. It is, it is the first World's Fair, right? Um, not that World's Fairs was a thing, but they continued it because of the Great Exhibition. But it's you know, this huge, the exhibition of the industry of all nations, a place to compare all these things. So I thought this is a point at which Britain is celebrating the fact that it is ahead and it has this huge technological lead over all of its, even its European neighbors. Um, and so I just worked back and 1651 is like, okay, England's just come out of a civil war. It seems like things are pretty bad. But then the problem is in the 1650s, you've already actually got a critical mass of inventors and scientists who just a few years later in, in the 1660s create the Royal Society you know, still one of the long, one of the longest surviving learned institutions and pro-science, pro-innovation institutions um, in the world. And so, okay, well, if the Royal Society is founded then, that needs to, we need to actually look at what led to the, that accumulate, that critical mass of people in the first place, right? That seems to be what's key. And so when you start looking back, I, I had to kind of take it back another century or so to the 1540s when England quite almost certainly is the sort of place where we wouldn't expect what we, given what we know about the Industrial Revolution and all of the kind of huge changes that happen, that it would happen in Britain, right? It's, England is, a, is, a, is an isolated nation. It, its urbanization rates are, you know, three point something percent, which is very, very low, you know, that much, much higher in Spain and Italy and the, the, the low countries, so Netherlands, Belgium today. Um, it, you know, London is teeny tiny. It's not even close to being the largest city in, in Europe, let alone the world. Um, so in terms of the agglomeration effects that you get from cities, that doesn't seem to be there. It's a kind of a backwater in many ways. You know, a lot of the inventions that are happening in Europe, they're finding after a few decades their way to England and, and the rest of the British Isles. So that, I think, is a good starting point. There's obviously some people doing invention. There's obviously some people doing what we might call today science. But that, I think, is a good point to start from, where Britain is clearly not in any kind of way ahead and so that's, that's the reason I take it. And also because and I, I increasingly think the crucial century is that first one, 1540s and 50s through to the 1650s and 60s, because it's by that time that even foreign visitors to Britain from the rest of Europe, from some of the countries that would have said that Britain is a backwater just a century earlier, are saying something is happening here. You know, it seems you to have this reputation for improvement. Yeah. If you were comparing not um, England to other countries of Europe, 
but perhaps Europe to other great civilizations like China and, and the Middle East and so forth. Um, would you would you go back even further? Um, like I could see an argument that you would trace something back to the Renaissance, maybe even to the reintroduction of Aristotle, um, you know, via Aquinas. What what do you think about that sort of intellectual history? Yeah, I mean, you, I think you can trace the improving mentality in the in the, in the sense that it comes to. England comes to Britain, I think, from other parts of Europe, um, and seemingly the, the the Renaissance group of people, um, especially in Italy, seem to have, be part of that impact. Um, what I do think, though, is that probably the improving mentality emerges repeatedly throughout history, often independently, often completely separately. It's not that, you know, radical idea, although it is seemingly very unusual. But I think, you know, Sung Dynasty China, I think, is, is a case of it. I think, you know, probably you have a few cases in the ancient world, possibly Tokugawa, Japan. I don't know much about India, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are another, they're often called efflorescences, these bubblings up of innovation, of, of the kind of um, innovative activity. The Dutch Republic is certainly getting it at around the same time as, as Britain is in that very early period. Um, but some of these cases seem to kind of stagnate and die off and they don't continue and they don't gather their own steam in the way that Britain seems to. With Britain it just seems to go up and up and up and up and up instead of kind of going up and then maybe stagnating or then going down again. And the, I mean the rate my main um, theory there is that it's not necessarily that Britain had more inventors or that it was more inventive as a society it's just that Britain British inventors were particularly good at convincing people to let them do these things or even to support their activities. Um, they create constantly the sorts of institutions that, that take things further and often, you know, copying it from other countries. Um, so the Society of Arts set up in the 1750s, which my, my first book is about, you know, that is one of these pro-innovation institutions. It's set up by inventors, some of them amateur inventors, to promote invention further, um, but it's actually copying an Irish predecessor. It's, you know, it's got French predecessors, um, but those French ones only last a few years and the Society of Arts still exists today. You know, so I think that there's just a, yeah. they're just better at coming up with these things or often just stealing, nicking the idea from elsewhere. Even the Great Exhibition of 1851 is actually a French idea, um, but they do it slightly earlier and they do it in a way that really works and becomes a permanent institution. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'd love to actually just keep asking you more and more questions. We're running a little on time. I want to get to some audience questions. All right, I'm yes, going to ask you one more, which is that I ask everybody, um, which is especially for the high school students who do have in the audience. Um, what advice uh, or common wisdom that is given to, uh, to teenagers uh, do you actually think is wrong? And what would you tell them instead? Gosh, what sort of advice is given to teenagers? I don't know. Or what did you hear as a teenager that you think was wrong in retrospect? I don't know. I, I don't have good advice as a teenager, I think. <laughs> wow, you're very lucky. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know. That's an interesting one. I, I'd say what advice I would give to teenagers. Sure. Because um, I, I can't think of the negative. I can maybe think of the, the, the sure. positive, which is that, you know, given what I found in my research, it's never too young to improve things, to innovate. And, and I say that in a, 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 what I want to be clear, I want to be clear about what it is to be an inventor, to have the improving mentality. Basically, by me just communicating the idea to you just now, you you could have it, right? That you could be inspired by what I've just said and go, okay, that's a great idea. I should go about doing it. And all I mean by that is just optimizing your life or things that you see. And that doesn't mean, you know, think there and kind of, you know, the, the thinking man, the Rodin's thinking, August Rodin's thinking man, and kind of just come up with an invention. That's not how it works. All it really is, is about seeing existing processes and, and or seeing existing ways that things are done and improving them, making them, you know, making a design a bit more beautiful or aesthetic, making uh, a process a bit more efficient or effective, you know, or, you know, or faster or save on resource costs or so on. Like that's ultimately what all of these 1,452 or, and actually however many more thousands I've missed from that sample were doing, right? These are, these are incremental improvers. And sometimes your incremental improvements can have these huge outsized effects. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, given what I've said, that you don't need to be an expert and you can be from any background or anyone, you know, anyone can be an inventor and it's, it's, it's never too young, I, sus I, sus I suspect, to start. 
All right, great. Um, with the last 10 minutes, let's, uh, let's try to get through maybe a few questions from the audience. So um, Long asks, why are most of the best universities by consensus located in the English speaking world? Gosh, that's an interesting one. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, I don't know the answer to that, but if I were to hazard an educated guess, it's that countries that industrialized first, that had that acceleration of invention, not only got rich off that through a variety of means, but also, you know, some of them not so peaceful, I must be said, you know, using their, pressing their technological advantage, but they got rich. And then with riches comes the kind of money that you get to spend on education, right? So I don't think it's necessarily something to do with the English speaking world as such, um, but because America, you know, first Britain and then America becomes the industrial powerhouse of the world. Um, and through those resources can spend it on places like Harvard and, I mean, if you look at the amount of money that goes into Harvard, you know, it'd be interesting to see uh, a, a list that kind of shows the efficiency of universities. Harvard may well be top of the rankings a lot of the time, but it's also, I think, one of the richest universities in the entire planet, right? If not the richest by far, I think its endowment is larger than some countries, you know, annual expenditures, you know? So, so I, I, it'd be interesting to see, you know, placement in the ranking versus amount of money that they have to deal with. Yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, one interesting thing I would note about this is that uh, it was cert it was not always the case. So in the 19th century, the best universities were in Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, and they invented this the the model of the research university, um, and America deliberately copied, I believe, that model at, in the late 1800s. Johns Hopkins University was one example of, in 1870 something was was founded with a. Um, uh, and almost all the faculty had been educated in Germany because that was where you went at the time to go get a technical education. And then I think, uh, and Harvard kind of retrofitted itself. Harvard was founded in the 1600s, but it was just a college and it sort of um, it upgraded itself, I think in the late 1800s or early 1900s, added graduate programs and degrees and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think similar thing happened with like Oxford and Cambridge that they kind of, you know, maybe upgraded themselves from these medieval, you know, what the medieval university was to, um, to the modern research. So, so I would, I would look at that. How did, how did maybe the, the U S and the UK maybe pull ahead of Germany, uh, mm. you know, after Germany had, had, had had the lead. That's where I would start looking. And before that. Germany, it would have been, I would have said the low countries, you'd go to Leuven oh, or yeah. Leiden, you know, it's, 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 it's those sorts of places that you would go to, or perhaps Italy, you know, all the, all the English mm -hmm. gentlemen in the 17th century are going to Padua. And, and places like yeah. that. So it does, it does shift over time. Yeah. So, okay, uh, Vital asks uh, the stagnation question. Is the pace of innovation slowing down? And if so, what is, is that lowering productivity and growth? Um, I'm, I'm skeptical of this. I'm maybe not an optimist, but I, I think if anything, we're seeing it continuing apace. You know, today there are more inventors than have ever existed in the history of humanity partly because there's more people than have ever existed in the history of humanity. But also I think the proportion of those, you know, we haven't, the, the spread of the improving mentality, the spread of these institutions that promote innovation, they're just as, a, you know, they, they keep getting reinvented every few generations. And so we actually have quite a lot of inventors. And here's the interesting thing, right? You only need, it's not like even, it's not like you need lots of inventors to invent a single technology. Very often, you know, you only need one person to invent the flushing toilet. So then for everyone to be able to use the flushing toilet. So the fact that we have more inventors than ever, even if as a proportion of the population, it was small than ever, what matters is the aggregate number of inventors, right? So we've got more than ever. And so I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that they're going to be, you know, spreading uh, or pushing out the frontiers of, of technological possibilities quite um, dramatically. Um, you know, in most ways, I look at just the past 10 years, I think of the transformations that have happened then. And because it seems gradual, we don't really notice it. But, you know, I look at my phone or something and I think that's astonishing. 
I think of the fact, right, I mean, 10 years ago, I don't think this call that I'm having right now with Jason, with all of you, would have sustained 18 participants, or however many our participants are, are on it, or, <laughs> you know, or it would have taken a day or something for it to upload it later to YouTube or wherever, you know, there's, there's so much improvement happening on so many different metrics that we often just don't notice, I don't think. Yeah. Um, okay. Juan David asks, uh, who's the innovator who has amazed, amazed you the most over and over and why? Today or from, from history? I assume from history. I assume it means from history. Well, my favorite, I think, is a guy called uh, Benjamin Thompson, who's American born, um, but then fights on the loyalist side in the American Revolutionary War and then comes to Britain. Um, and he ends up being a count of the Holy Roman Empire for a place in America, despite the fact that America abolished um, aristocratic titles. Um, so Count Rumford, um, he was doing all sorts of things with uh, um, thermo, what's it, what's my jig? You know, just looking at fireplaces, looking at ovens, looking at how to improve the efficiency of um, heating processes. And it's not really his inventions that are so interesting, but it's his life stories that he goes from basically just being a kind of backcountry school teacher to being a count of the Holy Roman Empire and one of the you know, most prominent gentlemen in, 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 in Britain. And as, at one point is kind of, kind of innovation consultant who's also a minister for various different ministries in Bavaria and founds the Royal Institution, which another in, in, you know, kind of takes, tries to to, to promote science in many other ways and ends up being the place that employs Humphrey Davy and Michael Faraday and so on. So you know, this is a very interesting character who just, his, his life is ridiculous. I could spend the whole hour talking about just going through the story, I think. So go and look him up. Wow, all right. Um, so let's see, uh, from the audience. So Grant asks, uh, what happened to the Mechanics Institutes? You mentioned they started moving towards infotainment um did they keep going in that direction or what what happened to them so that was the problem by the 1850s that the society of arts sought to solve with qualifications so they set up these examination systems for the mechanics institutions to use and they seem to flourish basically after that is that suddenly you have this thing this very concrete thing that people can work towards and so they rely upon the mechanics institutions to to provide them with that education that they can then get these qualifications and then get, I guess, other types of job or get a promotion or something. Um, so in a sense, I guess the, the problem is solved in some ways. And then over time, those institutions morph into very often other institutions. They've be, you know, nowadays, a lot of them, some of them have become technical colleges or they become universities or uh, like Birkbeck University or, uh, the main thing that's, that persisted was that they were their library collections. You know, there's, there's lots of different other institutional opportunities I think that they got over the course of the late 19th century. And then of course, you've got the, the government stepping in over the course of the late, increasingly the late 19th century and then certainly in the early 20th century, um, in some ways taking these things over or transforming them into different types of institutions. So they, they sort of evolve. Um, Overall, by the 1880s, I mean, what happens is that the Society of Arts examinations are taken up increasingly by the government. Um, and what they do is that they decide the government basically tries to start taking over education, not through taking over the schools or these institutions themselves, but by taking over what they teach. They start paying teachers who are very low paid and extremely low paid in those days. Um, I guess some, some today. That, that may well be true as well, right? Um, but they, they, they start paying teachers bonuses based on the number of people who pass the examinations. So uh, uh, payment by results, it's called. Um, and that encourages more and more teachers to switch to teaching things like uh, design or science. Um, or for schools, they apply it to teaching the three R's, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, All right, maybe we can squeeze in one uh, last question from Michael, um, have you seen any new art initiatives or groups uh, that you think might have some positive impact on progress? Any new art initiatives or groups? That's an interesting one. Um, you know, this is a, I can't think of anything specifically, but what, one thing that's I found very interesting since 
since Arts and Minds came out a couple of months ago, is that a lot of people have been reading it and saying, you know, we should have an institution like this. You know, the site, Royal Society of Arts still exists. It got the Royal in 1908, and, but it's a very different organization. When it's set up, it was a direct democracy that you would pay in a subscription fee and then you would pool that money and you would pay for inventions. Um, either people to reveal existing, the secrets to existing inventions or to actually do some of the invention. Um, and there isn't really anything quite like that today, a kind of bottom-up institution that does that. So well, I've been very interested to find people kind of approaching me saying, you know, what advice would you have if I were to set up a local version of this today? Um, and that's very exciting. So um, given the breadth of what it could do, this is a kind of national improvement agency and can be applied to anything and everything. Um, I think that's the, you know, arts organizations, you know, they're not just about fine arts, you know, art in this older sense just means artifice, you know, what, what is man-made uh, versus what is natural. Um, so things for the improvement of what we can do as people um, is, is what we should be focusing on there, I think. Great. All right, Anton, thanks so much. This has been a great conversation. Do you want to just tell everybody again, where can they find you and your work? Thank you. So my book is Arts and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Changed the Nation, um, which you can find Barnes and Noble, Amazon, wherever. Um, local bookstores, I suppose, if they're open. Um, my website, well, my, my, eight, my newsletter is Age of Invention, um, which is antonhouse.substack.com, um, or you can find me on antonhouse.com. Um, and that's a kind of regular, the newsletter is essentially the book I'm writing about the cause of the industrial revolution in bits and in bits and bits and bobs, um, as I do my research. Great. Yep. Highly recommended. And also I would uh, add, follow him on Twitter, Anton House oh, yeah. on, on Twitter. So not very good at this self-promotion <laughs> thing. <am> I? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And, uh, thanks to the audience for joining us today. Um, until next time. So long. Thank you.